So, all right. So last piece of the finance section that we're on right here too would be, uh, and you segued perfect into it is uh, masterminds, right? So mm-hmm. Go Abundance is the main mastermind that you're a part of. You know, millionaires in in a lot of different areas of their life, from health to generosity to wealth. So not only just wealth, yeah. but you know, you you had a lot of discipline, you had a lot of business success and financial mm-hmm. success before becoming part of a mastermind. You of course invested in coaching. You believed in always having a coach and and getting mentored up, getting pulled up. Mm-hmm. When you started getting around bigger guys, where you were now the small fish in the room, and then you want to earn status in the group and get pulled up what were some of the lessons that these guys taught you when you uh when, when you when you got into the into the space of like all right i'm not i'm not in, in my modesto central valley yeah, yeah. pond anymore and these guys are doing 10 times 20 times more than i am and and bigger bigger thoughts what were some of the main financial lessons you learned from from these people a little bit further down the road well i love the question number one like the power of a mastermind is people coming together and forming, forming this mastermind, right? Yeah. And and I, I uh, you could also do that locally too, mm-hmm. right? So as long as you get people that are all marching to the same direction, it's incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. But the first thing that I learned from from these from these guys is um, the feedback loop change. Mm-hmm. Right. It went from, you know, you know, when I started going into masterminds I already had a team, you know, I was you know, I had the number one spot in Modesto for half a decade, you know, and people would come to me for advice and I felt like the feedback loop was always from me bottom. Like I could just, all I was doing was pulling people up, right? Trying to pull people up. And I got into this room and, um, and I wasn't used to having my hands up and letting somebody else pull me up. Mm-hmm. And so I saw that the feedback loop went from, from me down to, to them down to me. And then they started pulling me up and, 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 and seeing like what limited beliefs I had, right? Mm. Because you, there's this big and greater world out there. And, and and I'm like, man, okay, so these guys are all doing things at a high, high scale. And and it's just being exposed to that world. Sometimes you see it and you're like, man, and then they pour into you like like the best advice that I give some people, especially like a newer investor or newer agent that says, hey, I want some advice. And they want to usually get advice from somebody who's been in the business for a long time. So if I say, hey, you want to go get financial advice, like the people that pop in your mind is like, okay, Warren Buffett you know, some of the, some of the big financial guys, but mm-hmm. reality, that's a wrong answer. Mm-hmm. Like you should, you should go get advice from somebody that is five years from where you're at, mm-hmm. because I'm going to give you more conceptual theory advice. Somebody's going to give you like, Hey, I just got punched in the face over the last five years. This is, this is how the blood taste. Right. And so it's more practical and tactical advice. And that's the room I was in. It was like, Holy shit, man, these guys are giving me like practical and tactical advice. But they also allowed me to see things at a bigger light and quiet some of the noise, right? Mm. There's so many different distractions. And I, distractions. I saw these guys were all hyper-focused on the life that they were building. And they created their own frequency. They didn't, they didn't uh, and, and it led to me homeschooling kids and doing all this stuff. Where like I learned it in the military, like these lessons that you learned in the past and they get, sometimes you, you're not ready to fully receive them until life is like, oh shit, I really, I've done I really this like this one. I really like this and, one. And so for me, a lot of it was the lessons I learned in the military. We would always say, the person that can't silence the gunshot is the one that's usually going to end up in a body bag or you're going to end up getting your buddies killed. Mm-hmm. And so what I mean by that is if you can't silence the gunshots of, of uh, the gunshots of, of war, you know, that the, like there's, there's a, there's a firefight happening. Like you have to silence them and keep moving. And so when we used to clear buildings out, we used to, um, we used to practice them with a squad of people, people on your 12 and on your six o'clock. And these guys would just visualize what we were going to do. So if we went into a place, we kicked the door down and, and everything went crazy. We already knew what the mission was. Everybody, I knew that the guy in front of me knew what the mission was. The guy behind me, would be, the mission was we knew we could run into resistance. And when the shots started going, we went into muscle memory. And, and if we ever froze, the guy behind us would say, hey, dude, keep moving, keep moving, move, move, move. Mm-hmm. Right. And you'd go back and it trigger you back in to, to go in and come out. But the guy that freezes is, 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 you know, if you froze, it means the next bullet's probably coming towards you. Mm. Right. It's the reason why that is. And so what is a gunshot today is social media. It could be politics. It could be COVID. It could be interest rates. It could be whatever. Those are all gunshots of life. And it's like you have to be able to silence the gunshots of life um, and know what the end result is. Uh, and you need to have guys around you that will tell you, keep moving. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, you're, hey, you're fucking up your marriage. Hey, dude, what are you doing, man? You're overweight. Hey, dude, you're like, you ended up in a hospital. You had a heart attack. Like, what are you doing? Or like, hey, you're out partying. Is that what you, 
you know, is that what kind of reflection is that to your to your kids? Able right? to really be honest yeah. with you, because you know what, they were all running at that frequency, and they were the guys that were willing to silence the gunshots for me and give mm. me that vision. And so those are some of the things that you learn, like in, in the past, that you're like, man, it just got re-emphasized again as I went into this higher level of masterminds. Is is that we all drew this vision of where we wanted our life to go, and I noticed that they were quieting everything else around them, and they were chasing their their dreams with high passion and everything that didn't that was just a noise it would just quiet it down and, and we used to, it, it was the six pillars of abundance that we would do um, but that was one of the biggest lessons that that i learned from 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 those guys is is um, that there were five years from where i was so they gave me a lot of practical and tactical advice of what i should be doing they helped me tighten up my personal financial statement right they, they helped me uh scale my team and build out systems of op- uh, the, the systems of operations that we have now right mm-hmm. because they've been there and done that and again the feedback loop went from me down to them pulling me up and that's what changed everything is getting into those rooms and that probably had to almost feel like a breath of fresh air was, in your yeah. life like when you have a feedback loop where you're always you're the one always helping down like actually having someone that has some answers for your yeah. questions um, yeah, just lighten, lightening the head, helping lighten the load and having the mental, mental breakthroughs and that you also have respect for and, and want to, want to be around. So create but it, it took humility initially. And this is, I think this is sometimes what I see some young people lack. Okay. Is that you gotta be, we call it, you gotta come in with the white belt mentality. Mm-hmm. I need to be teachable. Yeah. Right. Because think about it. I might've been a black belt in my community. If I show up with that black belt mentality, like, Hey, you can't teach me anything. And it's like. I'm going to show you what I've done. And then you have that ego. Like you have to be teachable and coachable. So if, if you show up and, and if you really want to grow, if you want to really find a group of people that could help you grow, is, is you got to be very vulnerable mm-hmm. and authentic with them. Mm-hmm. This is where I'm hurting. This is where my pain points are. You know, everybody else here, I had to have my shit together. Right? Because like every, everybody's looking for me like Daniel's a machine. Like he does all these, he does, doesn't do anything wrong. He has a great family. He's, he's healthy. He has a great business. It's like I can do. I, I, wealth is worth the weight, but it's also worth the weight that it bears on you. And I had an opportunity to take that weight bag off and be like, hey guys, I'm tired. Help me here. Right? And that's where the show, that 728 show with GoBundance really mm-hmm. helped because. You know, it came through the frustration that you saw a lot of these guys in that 728 shows. We interview people that went from a seven-figure net worth to an eight-figure net worth. And we realized that the, the abundance community, it's, it takes certain requirements. You need a $2 million net worth. Or in the champions room, you need a $10 million net worth. Is A lot of the guys there were, were like, they had this look of frustration. And, and we all felt it the same way. We're like, you thought whenever you became a millionaire, the life would get easy. It actually gets harder for you. Uh, you just deal with it better. And so with these guys, they're like, man, I thought like when I'm worth $4 million or $5 million, I thought life would get easier. And it's actually not. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's harder for mm-hmm. you because now you built a community that now needs your support and your love until you get into you get to that deck of million or what we talked about where you start defying gravity. You start transferring that weight of wealth to other capable people mm-hmm. that could help you lift that. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you tend to deal with it a lot better. So um, those are some of the some of the lessons that I've learned through that, and that's how that show really developed in Go And it's a private show. Yeah, you know? and I and I love the I love the image uh, for the show. I love the wolf. The yeah. wolf climbing up the hill is uh, is hungrier than the wolf on on the top on the top of the hill, right? Yeah. So yeah. just that Im- that imagery really does a good job of like burning in, and and I really enjoy that you guys do that for the team because it even shows that people would think that oh once i hit this level that the problems disappear and you've always made a really good point it's about not not really about problems disappearing it's that your back is stronger for carrying the load that your um that your heart is uh your your mind is calm your heart is bigger for the love that you need to express and your and your mind is calmer so i've I've always really really talk about that that. there's three things that money cannot buy Mm -hmm. number one is a house full of love yeah number two is a strong back Mm. right and number three is a calm mind mm. you have to earn those every day by putting in the work yeah. it doesn't matter if you're warren buffett he, if you he, he's like no amount of money is gonna get him a fit body you yeah. gotta earn that shit at the gym yeah so what are we doing every day to be able to earn that calm mind and that strong back to be able to um withstand the pressure that the success that we have or the wealth that we build is going to put on us and that's my job as, as a parent to my kids it's like how can i make sure that my kids' principles are instilled in them strong enough so that way they're able to withstand the pressure that this world is going to put on mm-hmm. them, right? And so um, 
and sometimes we're not ready for that. And sometimes we look at a failure as a, damn, I failed, or a struggle as, man, like, why am I struggling so much? All you're doing is earning that weight, yeah. right? You're learning how to carry that weight. It's like, how do we, how do we do it with more grace? They don't get, they don't get easier, right? The problems don't get easier. They get much bigger. We just tend to deal with them much better with a lot more grace. Yeah. And, and, and the thing that pops to mind as we kind of close the lid on the financial section would be that if we're outsourcing the courage and always kicking the can down the road, when that, when we actually do have to face, it's like letting the dragon grow in the cave, right? Mm -hmm. Kill it when it's a baby. The, the longer we let it grow, the bigger we let the problem get, the more it has the ability to actually crush us Mm -hmm. when we have to deal with it. When life forces us yeah. to deal with that with that problem so i, I love that Every, everything wrapped up on the on the finance side you know um you have a lot of experience knowledge and i, I really appreciate that and versus uh, you know i think a lot of people sometimes talk from a communicative standpoint and 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 you really showcase your scars and and, and your care for people and how you um teach um you know on a lot of different subjects but especially finances um Bridging into fitness. I'm, mm. I'm sitting. I'm sitting in front of you right now. Uh, I've been making a joke at the office lately that you got more veins than watches, and uh, you're, you look good, man. Your skin looks good. You got you, you added, added some muscle on. Um, I know back to always kind of having coaches in your life that yeah. you worked with uh, with Rami, and then uh, before that you were running Ironmans. Talk to me a little bit about the contrast between building muscle and and kind of doing a bulk and then a a shred down versus what you were doing for a number of years in biking and swimming and running and and doing ironmans and and what those two different fitness elements have looked like in your in your life yeah i think let's start with just fitness in general is something that you can't build overnight like fitness is a lifestyle Mm -hmm. right and and that lifestyle comes with a lot of different benefits right and so um i think for me my fitness uh pursuit of fitness has always been that like you know i started doing ironmans and 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 doing all these crazy things and then it went into like doing something completely different which is like well yeah i've never lifted weights let me see if i could lift some weights and getting the right coach for it stepping into that uncomfortable state of okay looking like an idiot Mm -hmm. right that Mm -hmm. uh, now i'm consciously incompetent i know i want to get there but i'm incompetent so i'm pursuing that consciously competent state and it takes coaching it takes me showing up even though i might not see progress as quickly and stuff mm-hmm. like that, but I think I think that the the lessons that I've learned there is is just how to be super consistent and, and the amazing things that your body can do if you are consistent with it. And and it started with in the Ironman journey. I remember that like not being able to really run, and then doing my first triathlon that was an Olympic triathlon that you know it was a three hour race, whatever it was, you know. And at that point, it was I think it's like a half a mile swim and a you know, 20 mile bike ride or something like that. And a six mile run. I remember that was, that was the hardest thing I'd ever done. I'm like, Oh my God, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. But then I kept pursuing it, pursuing it. And then slowly it went into 70 miles and then it went to 140 miles for Ironmans. And then we started doing these ultra endurance events. And I'm like, man, I, there is no way I would have been able to do any of this stuff. And it's like, the thing is, is how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Mm-hmm. It's like the, the human body is able to do these amazing things. But really, really cool about Ironman and doing that is you tend to want to find your limit. And guess what? When you, you, you know, there's that, that, that graph you say you fuck around and find out. Yeah. Well, you find it. <laughs> and then, But the cool thing of, of yeah. it is you learn how you respond to it. Mm-hmm. I don't think people push themselves far enough to see what happens when your mind, your body, and everything is telling you to stop. Mm. And it goes back to that initial muscle memory thing is you put all these miles into repetitions of running and biking and, and nutrition and swimming to do this 140 mile bike race where you're, you're swimming two miles, you're, you're, you're biking, you know, 112 miles and you're running a whole marathon in one day. And the people say, where do, you, where do you go? I'm like, man, you go to this very dark space and, and, it, and it relies to this muscle memory. And that is what life is like. If you really think about it, like when I used to run Ironman races, the people would say, are you ready for your race? I'm like, dude, are you ready to get punched in the face? <laughs> like, is anybody ready to get punched in the face? Yeah, no. no. But, but you're never really ready, but you're, you're prepared to execute at the level of effort and preparation that you did. Yeah. So what I mean by that is like, look, I don't know how my body's going to respond, but I'm, I, I know I am prepared. I put the time and effort. So I know that when my mind says stop and my legs are screaming my lungs are screaming that i just go into this muscle memory of all this work that i put in so can you imagine those lessons that you take in your relationship so Mm -hmm. are you ever ready to be tested in your relationship 
right? You're having a couple of drinks, the opposite sex comes around and then you get flirted by some, some girl, you have a couple of drinks and you're mm-hmm. like, man, are you ever ready for your relationship to your challenge? Only to the level of the time invested that you built on that relationship with your wife. Mm-hmm. Right? So it goes back to your faith. Are you ever to get tested with your faith? Some people falter. It's because they lacked on the preparation. We're never really ready to get challenged. Right? Nobody wants to get challenged. But we're just, we're just executed at the level of time we've invested in that relationship and that discipline or whatever it might be. And, and that's something that I learned in, in, in the whole Ironman training. And you kind of take that and the stuff I learned in the military, stuff that, you, that, that I deal with in my, in my work and my relationship with my wife and my kids and my faith walk. Um, is that, but, you know, finding what your body does and being able to say, man, whatever you could, whatever you focus on, you could actually do it and actually putting the work in has been really, really fun for me. So yeah, it's a new journey for me, lifting weights. I've never really done that. So I've I've been having a really good time, time with it. And, and I'm like, man, and and what's the difference between what I'm seeing right now? What was Daniel, like, what was your size when you were running Ironman versus now, like where you're at with putting a little bit? Yeah. So it's, we did a whole year transformation thing. So, um, when I was running Ironmans, I'd I'd weigh up my race date, it would be 178 pounds, about 10% body fat. And, uh, and I look like a runner. Right. And so back to, I turned 40 and I'm like, look, I want to be my son's superhero. And that's mm-hmm. why I always did crazy things, right? Because I'm like, look, my dad, people chase these crazy people, right? Yeah. People that chase things with massive discipline. And like, dude, there's something special about that person, mm-hmm. right? Like, there, I, there's no excuse. There's a reason why. Like, we eliminate excuses. Like, I could train and do Ironmans. I, we could homeschool our kids. We could travel 90 days a year. I could run an amazing business. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a discipline of saying no to anything that doesn't allow, align with that vision, right? Mm-hmm. And people get attracted to that. And so I wanted to be like, but that, and that's great. But, but I also had this 180 pound body at 40 years old. I'm like, dude, I want to be able to look like a guy that could defend his family. I want to be able to see like my son sees me and says, that's my dad. Mm-hmm. Right. And so for me, I was 40 and I'm like, let me, let me, let me try this. I'm going to give this a shot and do something completely different. And, and it went for me. You know, being 178, 10% body fat to like the whole transformation, I ended up being at 196 at like about 11% body fat. So I put on 18 pounds of muscle in about a year. Mm-hmm. We're going to do it again next year and we're hoping to be at about 205 mm-hmm. with about 10 or 11% body fat. I say 11% because, man, it takes a different level to get down to 10%. Yeah, I yeah, don't know if I yeah. really want to have that kind of dedication. It's a little animalistic. But it's funny because my son the other day, he's like, hey, dad, have you ever heard of this guy? And I'm like, no, who is it? And he shows me this cartoon character and this guy with this gray beard. And he's a superhero. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, see, I wanted to be a superhero in my son's eyes. And that's yeah. the thing. It's like kids... It's not what you tell them to, to do. It's like, what they see. It's what they see. They'll catch more than from you than it is what comes out of your mouth by your actions. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to be the guy that um, I wanted to be physically healthy as I am spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and in my in my finances too, you know? Yeah. I didn't want to be the guy that was financially wealthy but health poor. Did you... Uh... Because I know that a lot of guys that were in the military before, it really kind of sets that standard for having a personal accountability to fitness, that that's important, how you dress, how you take care of yourself, how you polish your boots, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's a there's there's a standard. Was there any point between when you got out of the Air Force to present day where you've ever actually, like, taken the foot off the gas for your personal fitness? Yeah, see, I was kind of, I'm wired a little different. Okay. I think a, there's a lot of guys that... That go into the military and they're like, I'm done, right? And I'm, like, I'm done and they stop doing all this stuff. They like yeah. actually go the opposite way. And, and for me, when I got out of the military, I remember calling my sergeant. And I'm like, dude, fuck, civilians are lazy as shit. I'm like, they're, they're, I'm like, I don't know what they do half the time, right? So for us in the military, it wasn't a day we had a day off. Mm-hmm. It's a day that the military said you didn't have to wear a uniform. Mm-hmm. So that was a mentality I had. But the thing is, is sometimes you go into the military and, 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 and you know, there's, there's some shit that happens, right? With the guys that, you know, you're leaving your family. You know, it's, it's interesting when you really think about it. Like when, when we go into the military, we're going to defend what? Mm-hmm. We're defending the Constitution of the United States. Mm-hmm. And in order for you to defend it, guess what you have to let go? You have to let go of the Constitution of the United States. You give up your freedoms to fight for freedoms. Mm-hmm. That's what's freaking nuts, right? But that creates a lot of trauma for some people. And so what your I found... Life, your life is not your own. Your life is not your own. And, and yeah, you go and you have sometimes you have to do some pretty bad shit. And mm-hmm. so 
Um, and things happen. Like my, my brother was served with the, the first Marine Division. They saw a lot of combat. They came back with a lot of purple hearts. They lost a lot of guys. And my brother even now suffers from extreme PTSD. Even though he's a doctor, even though he's discerning to be a priest now, he's giving it all up and doing all this cool stuff. But he suffers from a lot of demons. And so what I found is that I used the military as a reference point, not a residence, mm. right? So, and I see people do that a lot, that they'll take a trauma that happens to them and they wear it like a warm sweater. And mm. they're like, I can't do this because of this. I can't do this because of what happened in my past or whatever. But the first thing that you have to do is evict yourself from it mm. and say, look, it is not a residence. It's a reference point for me. Yeah. I'm going to evict myself from it. So that's what I did. Yeah. I look at the military and I didn't look at not having a day off as a thing off. I just looked at it as a reference point. It's not as bad as that. And it's funny because even when we're racing Ironmans, people will say, hey, how do you feel? I was like, I'm just glad I'm not swimming anymore. Yeah. You know, and then when I was running the marathon, like, I'm just glad I'm not doing that shit anymore, right? And so it's always like, how quickly can you evict yourself from their traumas and use them as reference points instead of these residences that people stay stuck? And that ends up being the claim of many people's dreams is the fact that they take that trauma and they wear it as a warm sweater and they can never move past it. They were mm. sat in it way too long. Yeah. No, I, I really love that. And to get back to the question, did you ever let your personal fitness uh, fall off? Or were you saying that you're so wired in that, I was just in always, that reference point I was that, wired, that you just like, it's just, it just like, it, like, as much as you are, mm -hmm. Daniel, fitness, fitness is, is a part of it. And which makes a lot of sense too, because if you have big dreams and big goals, you knew that you always had to keep the engine calibrated in a way to handle, yeah. handle that load of stress that would would black out a lot of people yeah. and the and the reason i think i brought that up in even into the military side of it is like the um that trauma and end up people will run away from it and they'll end up becoming overweight or whatever mm -hmm. stops the sport and oh, yeah and they'll, and they'll say you know what that was my identity mm -hmm. so but i knew my vision was clear so i'm like hey, i gotta chase that next future vision myself so I, I kept growing and growing and sometimes i wasn't as healthy with my fitness like i wasn't truly pursuing but never running. fully never fully fell yeah. off the wagon i was focusing on building my business i was probably as unhealthy as i was i was working seven days a week and my wife used to say dude we're not even ships passing in the night we're not even on the same freaking ocean like I, who are are you i haven't seen you in seven days she was mm. working at nights as a labor and delivery in the liver delivery department and I, was, I was i was selling real estate so there was points in my life that i was super unhealthy and unbalanced right and i think even unbalanced i think it was there's a point that i was out of harmony which sometimes you have to do that yeah um but i, I think uh, i never really let myself fully go on the health aspect of it there's times i was i was totally out of harmony with what i should have been doing maybe i was drinking a little too much maybe i was dealing with my stress in a little different different way but but fitness fitness was always a, a yeah, habit always that, that that stayed with you and that's yeah. and that's awesome man. and i think your life is a testament because who knows how things would have gone if you had let yourself go physically yeah. right like that that would have started affecting a lot of other areas and we may not even be sitting here right now right yeah, it's just, sure, it just crazy how that how that goes so and you and you always do a good job of kind of segueing into the next section so that kind of closing the lid on uh fitness is uh is family so from from the outset you have a beautiful wife yeah. you have three beautiful kids um you guys have built an amazing life you guys got to homeschool for a number of years which allowed you guys to travel Welcome to my school right here. <laughs> yeah. travel travel and be flexible and yeah. and, and it's amazing I, I i a lot of your, your kids have all different personalities but they all seem you know pretty pretty great um what are what are some things that you're you know we always learn lessons in different decades what is something that daniel as a dad now in his 40s uh, wasn't able or, or wasn't doing in his, in his twenties and thirties. Cause you guys had kids pretty young, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, what was I not? I mean, I think initially I didn't really prioritize my family that way. Okay. You know, and to be honest with you, I think I was working way too hard and, and through that mastermind, I was, I was uh, held accountable to become a better father. Like, dude, you say you want to be a better father, but you're, you, and it's like, do your actions match your prayers? And I'm like, no, they don't. Like, mm. you could pray for something to change, but God gave you the will to make a change mm -hmm. by actions. And mm -hmm. my actions were matching my prayers. And it took somebody to hold me highly accountable to that and start prioritizing my family. Yeah. Right. So there's a time that I, I wasn't fully engaged with the family because I was just working my butt off. Right. Yeah. But then I, I just said, you know what? I'm not going to outsource my family. I'm not going to outsource my kids' education. And I need to make sure that the principles that uh, that my family runs on are going to be strong enough to withstand the pressure that the world's going to put on my kids. So I can outsource that. And in real estate, it's different, man, because I'm like, look, we, we run, our time schedule is, is, is not the nine to five. Mm -hmm. We exchange it for a five to nine. 
Mm-hmm. So I can't run a business and also be the man that I want to be forcing myself to run on the regular calendar schedule of society. Yeah. So I had to bring it into my frequency and my cadence. And if I wanted to really do life with my kids, I had to bring them into my world. Mm-hmm. And that's what homeschooling really did for me and, and my wife. You know, she she stopped working at the hospital and she became the CEO of the house and homeschooling the kids. And we got, we got to do a lot of life with the kids, man. You saw them at the office a lot. Mm-hmm. And my son walked a lot of projects with me and and we did that for half a decade. We just put them back into school because my son's doing sports. So that was an incredibly challenging moment, you know, for us to, to do that. But uh, we got to do a lot of a lot of a lot of time with the kids. And it's interesting because somebody told me they're like, hey, you know, the, if you take 100 percent of the time you're going to spend with your kids, 100 percent, every minute you count, every single minute, and every second, 80 um, percent of that time you spend with your kids is going to happen before the age of 18. After the age of 18, you're fighting for the last 20 percent. And I'm like, I'm outsourcing. Am I really outsourcing that most critical 80%? Yeah, because it'll yeah. be what'll be really interesting to see is that I think a testament to being a good parent is later, right? Yeah. Seeing the decisions when they actually are able to be adults and make decisions on their okay. own as you keep releasing more and more freedom to them is seeing um, yeah. you know what what choices they make in their life. And what's funny is that like, you, like they'll have lessons that are ingrained in them, just like your dad gave you lessons that ended up being ingrained in you. And we can uh, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, that that they're gonna be like, oh yeah, that's why dad. Like they're gonna have realizations when they're twenty five and thirty and stuff. And and like you said, you can't outsource that. Like yeah, the yeah. lessons, if you want to make them strong to be able to make good choices in society going forward and be strong enough to not uh, fold to the regular you know challenges and blessings yeah. that life uh serves up you know in different different ways on different days um you know it'll be it'll be exciting to see yeah, it's caught over time how you know, really how that how that goes um speaking of family you know you're uh you're first uh first generation here yeah. right dad came here when you were 17 so talk to me a little bit about some of the lessons that you got from your dad that that made you the daniel that you are today yeah i think like life happens for you right um, yeah that's what it was for me. Like I got to see, I, my dad never got more than a third grade education. He didn't teach me academically a lot, but I caught a lot from my father, mm-hmm. right? And it taught me that, you know, you didn't have to, you know, there's difference between action taking, right? And I saw my dad build an amazing life, never making more than $47,000 a year back in the day, right? raising five kids. But I saw him you know, humble himself and do side projects and do the neighbor's yards and clean neighbor's houses and do all that. And he didn't really care what the neighbors thought of him because his vision was his driver. And and that goes back to silencing the gunshots. My dad silenced all the noise. My dad had an old school Toyota pickup, moved us into a nice neighborhood. You know, neighbors had nice Hummers and boats. And I remember the neighbors say, how's your dad doing? How's your dad doing? I'm like, my dad's doing great. He just worked his butt off and he saved and he invested in real estate. My dad's race wasn't that long. That was another lesson that I learned that kind of taught me to put myself on the salaries. My dad didn't need more than $47,000 a year in passive income to be able to be financially independent. And so he, he, he bought a property every other year, small homes. And I saw him build a passive income that was much larger than his, his income. And he was able to retire himself by investing and quieting out what everybody else thought. He didn't need the new truck. He didn't need the boat. He didn't need to. Um, he didn't need to really care what neighbors thought when he was mowing their yards or doing any of that stuff. Like he just quieted all that stuff. And I got a firsthand seat at that. Like they bought homes where they didn't even know how to read the documents. I had to go and help them at 12, 13 years old. I didn't really learn English until I was 10. <laughs> right. So here I am. I'm like, look, if my parents could do it, like I could do it. Yeah. Um, so I got, you know, I got a first first hand seat up then. I remember having a conversation with my mom when I came back from the military. This was around two thousand one. I was I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I remember I, I, I was so excited to talk to my mom and I'm like, Mom, I just read this book. You can't believe it. They're talking about you guys. Like, Mom, you could have read you could have wrote this book. And I, I got the power of seeing that firsthand. And my dad used to always say, like, when you come when you came to the US you know, um, and you see, when you see the streets, you don't see pavement, you see opportunity. And, mm. and that was just the way my dad always wired us. And he taught us, you know, the importance of, of money and the importance of earning it and, 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 and being good stewards of it and, and all that stuff and prioritizing what was important to us. And they also taught us the power of community. You came to a new country not knowing anybody. All you know is what? 
the community, the people. Mm-hmm. So the, the relationship capital, he taught me the importance of relationship capital and how important it was for family that, that I learned a lot from, from my dad just yeah. by watching him. Yeah, a ton of, ton of work ethic and then, and then showcasing that delayed gratification that it doesn't matter if the neighbors are driving Hummers. They probably lost it all in 2008 anyways. I did. They short uh, sold, I short sold a couple of their homes. Man. Yeah, That's yeah. And, 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 and while your dad's still driving the 98 Toyota Tacoma, right, just putting right mm-hmm. along, working his race. And I think that goes back to even your Lego example is that if your dad found a way to give himself clear instructions to build a life mm-hmm. and there wasn't a sense of entitlement, like you said, like coming over here, it was a, uh, it's opportunity, it's opportunity and not, um, some sense of like, well, this is what I'm owed. And this is, this is how much I feel like working, you know? And even to this day, I, I can, I can see the wiring, the Dell real wiring in him too. Like his eyes, like, you know, he's, he's an older man. Right. But, uh, but in his eyes, you can see still a sense of like, kind of like he, he's yeah. still watching what, Still watching what's going on and, and, and a very interesting guy. So, um, yeah, he, is, he taught us the uh, victor over, over victim mentality. Mm-hmm. We didn't come out here with a victim mentality, it was a victor mentality saying, no, oh, you know, we, we could just, you know, we can't, we can't, uh, sometimes we don't have the ability to change what opportunities we have, but we, we, we have the ability to show up the best we can, yeah, you know, and put the work in. And, and I got to see that from a man that was in everybody else's eyes uneducated mm-hmm. but he was super street smart mm-hmm. you know and uh and i and i i got the blessing to be able to see that man and he taught me what the importance of family yeah you know and that's something that i teach my kids now and and something that again you see and it's in the bible think about the the the, the commandment of honor your father and your mother so you'll have a long fulfilling life and the line he's given us it's the only commandment that really gives you a reward and you think it's a why is that because the bible even knows that more is caught than taught like, do I expect my kids to honor me when I'm older if I'm not honoring my father? Like, my mom and dad were sitting in this seat yesterday watching a movie with my kids. And my kids see that, that I don't say family's important. I show them that family's important. And because I honor my father and their mother at their elderly age, my kids would turn around and honor me because that's not what I taught them. It's what they caught from me by my actions. And so, like, again, it goes back to, like, these theories and these lessons are taught in time. It's just a matter of, okay, how, when are we going to respond to them and actually implement actions? Like, I want, a, I want my kids to honor me when I'm older. That's a prayer for me. How do my actions reflect that prayer? Mm. And it showed it last night. It shows it every single time. My parents will be, I see my parents a few times a week, right? Yeah. They live freaking less than a mile away. You yeah. Know? I moved next door to my parents for five years. Um, because that's how important family is. And that's what my dad really taught me is the importance of community and that commandment of honoring your father and your mother. Yeah. Yeah, So, and, and that was, uh, you know, you're always, you're always leading, leading up to the next question, right? So my next question was what is one or, or maybe two lessons that you would like your kids to take forward? Um, I think you said one of them right there, which is that, you know, honoring on your, like, it's not something that you're you, you you you've probably said it to them, but more than anything, they're catching it from you. So beyond um, them respecting, you know, honoring mom and dad and family going mm-hmm. forward, what's another lesson that you would like your kids to yeah. kind of take forward into their lives? If if uh, you know, uh, at some point you will be gone, right? That you know yeah. that they would that they would take forward. I think it's just two, and almost they're pretty similar. I would say you know on the on the back of we just lost a couple people in our industry mm-hmm. you know to suicide mm-hmm. and i'm like the one thing i want them to know is uh they're never alone mm-hmm. and even if if their their earthly father's not around like their heavenly father's always there yeah and, and I, if, if i could teach them that then then i think you know that's that's my main priority and um i would say the second thing would be based on their principles in in my life like i've lost a lot of money and people have people are people they're wired different right not everybody's going to do the right thing mm-hmm. um so one of the things that my kids have seen me do and heard me say several times is only because somebody else compromises their principles doesn't mean you have to mm. so honoring your principles is going to be so important mm-hmm. uh so those would those would be the, the the two things and principles for us is that family right yeah. it's also it's also that so um if, if i do those those two things right and it goes back to like the community and accountability part, right? I'm accountable to my family. Yeah. You know, they, they, that book, Blue Zones, um, it's a great book. People, it's about eating and eating the right things. But they, they found is that indigenous people ate the best things that were non processed, very good stuff. But what they found is a reason why people live so long is they never lost reason or purpose. Yeah. Is um, the generations above them were always honored. So they never had a reason to die off. 
And I think the problem with some of the generations now, you move away from your parents, and you get disconnected from this community. What we want is a community. We want people. We want a culture. We want, we want that. Like I never want my parents to lose hope that we don't need them. Yeah. We need them. We want yeah. to honor that, right? So uh, those, the, it goes back to that whole accountability and the, the want for community and how we built the team. You know, Our team has a culture. So my job is to build leaders. And we say that, like, uh, look, I, I might be called the team leader, but we're a group of leaders. And, and we're, I'll put any of our members up against anybody else because I know that they will hustle and they would do what needs to be done and yeah. they will be honorable with it. Um, it's like, how can you transfer this level of knowledge and make people the best that they could possibly be, the leaders that they could possibly be, where they could leave you anytime, mm -hmm. but build a culture that keeps them with you because they know Daniel's always chasing a bigger life. Yeah. I could build an amazing world with, 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 with Daniel. And like when we're building a business, you want to hire really good people. And we always talk about that. Like, hey, look, you have to create enough opportunity to keep really talented people, like say Matt Foster, on a team. Mm -hmm. And that's great. Um, and, and it's like, but build a culture and a family that keeps them there. Um, we have to do the same thing for our kids. Like, how can we create a culture that keeps your kids coming back? And yet give them enough opportunities with us so they could continue to grow within our family too. And it goes back to like the whole wealth building journey of, you know, building a family office and, and seeing and making sure my kids have an ability to uh, plug into their own genius within whatever investments and, and whatever family office we build, whether, yeah. you know, they want to be a builder, contractor, you know, a, um, an attorney, you know, in the real estate business, a land, be whatever. able to be able to support the leadership route that they want to right. walk but at the same time have a culture of family that you guys still stick together. But it takes me always chasing fear. Yeah. I always have to chase fear. I always have to grow. And it goes back to like the, the, the four C's that we talk about. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Let the, let the audience know about this. This is, if there was ever a spot that you want to like stop off on the side of the road or, or take a pen out and take notes is, is the four C's. The so, four C's yeah. is, is a level. Number one, you have to commit to what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so as you commit, you have to chase and you have to earn courage. Mm -hmm. How do you earn courage? Well, it's on the other side of fear. So you got to chase fear. Mm -hmm. But if you chase enough fear, most people let fear drive their dreams. Right? The second C is the graveyard of broken dreams. But if you chase fear and you earn your courage, you find out what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. Once you find out what you're capable of, you go to the fourth C, which is what's my capacity here. Right. And what's crazy is once you get to that fourth C, you could wear that fourth C just like that sweater and just stay there to that capacity and that genius. Or you could eventually slay that dragon. The person that got you here is not going to get you to where you need to be. And then you got to chase that incompetency again. Right. Mm -hmm. I did that when I changed disciplines in sport, when I changed disciplines in my business and all that stuff. It's like you're constantly chasing fear, chasing growth, chasing a higher level of capability and capacity. And the more I chase fear, the more that I'm going to be able to keep amazing people around me because they're like, that guy is never going to stop growing. He's never going to stop chasing. And as soon as I stop growing, that's when people like you that are super talented, that could go anywhere and be successful are going to leave. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because like, I've stopped chasing fear and stopped chasing growth. It's, it's, uh, and, and, and high achieving type people, high talent people want to see, want to see a leader that didn't just be like, ah, I made it cool. Like you guys, you guys can handle the business. Now that'll work for a season. Like as long as there's money to be made though, that'll, that'll work for a season. But ultimately your, your, your best will start getting picked off just yeah. because there's, there's another layer underneath that wants like progress and growth mm -hmm. and, and still pushing for building for building something yeah. right. And, 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 and I can be a testament to this from seeing you day in and day out of not being afraid to also step out of, step out of production the way that you have and, yeah, and step into, big. step into a, a big fear, which is uh, growing, growing the group, which is like, especially when you've been in something for so long that you know, that's, you know, yeah. subconsciously beyond subconsciously competent that, that you just breathe Breathe in and breathe out on sales, right? Breathe in and breathe out on relationships of people and doing real estate like in your sleep, you know? Yeah. And to step out of that and be like, hey, I want to make sure that my team has the most opportunity that they can have. And now my role will be continuing chasing fear on a bigger scale, but also chasing fear in myself that that I'm the person that can... Uh, handle all the different personality types and 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 bear the burden because a lot of times people are coming in your office with problems not with 
solutions um, and, and, and be and, and be that guy. So I, yeah. I would say that, you know, being with you for the last three years, I, I've seen a testament of the door is open unless you're doing a podcast. And, yeah. um, and, and you've done a, You've done a really great job of, of chasing that and leading by example. You don't ask us to do anything that you yeah. wouldn't jump in first to do. And if anything, you probably almost need to be held back because it, it's hard not to want to jump into something that you that yeah. you that you and enjoy that's hard doing. and that's so. that was and so sometimes when you talk about the four seasons like it's easier sometimes people will listen because they've seen me lead from the front right and I, like, when i say it it's not like i believe it because i conceptually read it like i've done it like i just did it again right i've done it through all my my businesses like when i stepped out of sales think about it. you get this genius you get the like you got this, like you're the starting quarterback. You're really good at what you do. You have amazing success rate. You work with amazing people, and then you got to say, you know what? I got to get the next guy an opportunity. But then you go from being the quarterback to a coach, mm-hmm. right? We're going from the from the coach to the to the to the um, to the, to the owner, owner. Yeah. and you allow the people to shine. But it, it it had me stepping out of this subconscious competence, mm-hmm. and then stepping into that. See, I need to commit that this person's no longer serving me. Me sitting at dining room tables is playing the ground game. I need to play the air game and give more people like Matt an opportunity to to grow and build wealth and do all this other stuff. So for me, I had to chase fear. Mm-hmm. Get out of production means income drops means I put my business on other people. It's like okay, I'm managing people. I don't manage people. I manage principles. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what it is. And our, yeah. our team, you manage principles. Yeah. And so um, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Now I'm stepping into a, a team leader where, you know, how is that going to look? But I chased fear. I'm learning what I'm capable of. I'm seeing what the capacity is of the Del Rio group as we continue to grow it. So it's easier for me to say because I live it. Yeah. I live it every single day. Yeah. And, and it's like, but that's the thing that if anybody's listening to this, like what's one thing that you could do is take freaking action, mm-hmm. take action. And then not just once, but the superpower that I have, if somebody says, what's your superpower? Daniel? What is your superpower? Yeah. What's your superpower? I'm a consistent motherfucker. Yeah. There is nobody that you're going to meet that's as consistent as I am. Mm-hmm. The cool thing is I know what I go deep at. Yeah. And I'm not consistent at knowing cigars and golf and all this other stuff. Yeah. Like, you don't I, mind being a moron on things that aren't, aren't your choice. I am an absolute moron. I just about everything but the things that i focus on i go deep on and and the people that i have relationships with i honor those relationships mm-hmm. enneagram score of a six right mm-hmm. i'm a loyalist i go deep with people um and so and, and but the thing is is being consistent to see growth over time you know and knowing that you could build something amazing over a decade worth of chasing this person that you're designing so Mm -hmm. that that's something i would say would be my superpower and i would say that the one thing that under ties all of that is uh faith and i think uh you you kind of touched on um making sure that your kids are not alone um you know i'm a i'm a believer myself as well so it goes back to knowing that god is always with us and that and that faith really does help us uh, you know cross that bridge of fear because ultimately if i know that god's always got me then what can't I get after? I'm just mm-hmm. my own my own mental block. So I think yeah. I think what under ties all of this is that you've had always a um, a strong sense of faith, a strong sense of uh, commitment. Um, talk to me a little bit about your faith walk, about how usually that just kind of matures and matures yeah. and matures over over time. Where, where are you at today um, in in your faith walk, and what are some of the principles and standards you you hold yourself to mm. uh, to stay aligned with where you want to be in uh, in yeah. that faith walk? I'm I'm curiously chasing my faith. Okay. Right. I am a white belt in my faith, and I will be right for for a long time. Um, so you know, I, I grew up cradle cradle Catholic. Mm-hmm. Um, never really had a relationship with Christ until really I was it was pretty young when I was at youth group, and I really felt the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, okay, there's something there. And a lot of it was things that I was going on through my life where I felt pretty lonely, and I had to seek that right Mm -hmm. and so so um but i know that it's just like the lessons that we learn in life is we we get exposed to these lessons we spend our whole time trying to realize them not because we're not ready but maybe we don't have the back to withstand them quite yet right so sometimes it's not reading a ton of books but it's reading the same book over and over Mm -hmm. and over and over again Mm -hmm. and i would say that if to your best authors ben you know ben hardy's books you know james clear's books Read them over and over and over and over again. Become a student of them. And so for me, it was the Bible, right? And so I remember, like, I just finished reading the Bible in a year again um, Mm -hmm. when I was 40. And I'll tell you one thing. The Bible that I read at 40 was much different than the Bible that I read at 35. Mm. It was much different than the Bible I read at 28, right? Because I'm a father now. 
you know, I have three kids, wife, been married for almost 20 years, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a different Bible for me. So I, I read the Bible not in hope to understand it, right? But just to continue to learn. And, and I know that as soon as I'm ready to receive, like the lessons will come. And I truly do feel that, you know, God works in, in, in a lot of different ways. And, and it's like those reciprocal activators, Right. Where, you know, you buy a certain car and you see other people driving a certain car. You buy an investment. Everybody's buying that investment. Mm-hmm. But if I'm in scripture and I'm in my faith walk all the time, guess what? I'm going to see God speaking to me in different ways. And it might be somebody that's a non-believer that comes in and says something and reconfirms what I just read in scripture. That's something I was struggling with. I'm like, oh, my God, like God uses divine beings and human beings mm-hmm. to speak to you. Mm-hmm. But if you're not in script in scripture, if you're not constantly seeking to to learn, that spiritual eye is almost not even not on, turned not turned activated. on. Yeah. So so what my like spiritual that. walk looks like is I'm just priming my activator all the time and just reading and knowing that the Bible that I read again at 44 or 43 is going to be a different Bible because I'm going to be a different person. And it's not like we talk about. It's not doing the same thing ten thousand times. It's doing a different iteration of those things 10 different times. It's mm-hmm. that reiteration. It's not the mastery of doing the same exact thing 10,000 times. It's a different iteration every time you do it. So that's been my faith walking. And, you know, we were talking off camera. I'm like, look, I'm, you know, I was cradle Catholic. I'm going to a Christian church now. And, um, but guess what? I'm reading the Catechism of the Catholic Faith in a year, right? I've been yeah. going, I'm, I'm in September, so I'm day 300 or mm-hmm. close to getting to day 300. And, and I'm constantly learning, right? Yeah. I, I, like I've learned parts, I've read parts of the Quran, you know, dug deep in into the the book that we all read together, depending on even on their in their faith, which is like Genesis, right, mm-hmm. and all that and the concepts behind it. So, you know, I'm just I'm just learning, man, and I'm 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 showing up with a white belt mentality in my faith all the yeah. time, knowing that you know God's going to speak to me if I'm always in the Word. I think the one thing that people can take away, whether they're they're Christian or Muslim or or uh, Judaism, is is kind of keeping always a curiosity for ancient wisdom and the divine mm-hmm. that, um, you know, there's stuff has survived for thousands of years okay. for a reason. So if there's some common truths and, and, and veins in that, then we are just, um, not actually fully taking advantage of life to not, to mm-hmm. not, to not soak in, for to sure. not, to not soak in and stay, stay aware and stay being primed and letting it, letting it work on, work on us. Right. Like that's what I like to think of. Um, when you when you when we face the Bible every day, uh, like you're reading it, but it's it's reading you. It's working. It is, yeah. It's it's a two edged sword that's working on itself and working on you at the at the same time. Yeah, we say that in goals too. Like when I help people write goals, or like one of the things that simple goals say, mm-hmm. uh, I want to be a better husband. Mm-hmm. And like, what does that look like? What does it look like to be a better husband? Um, it's what dishes, asking your wife how you could help, speaking her love language, reading a book together, like actions, quality time, behaviors, yep. and all that stuff, yep. right? And, and it doesn't mean like you check off the box and guess what? I am a great husband, right? I'm a, like, that's it. It's, um, it's confirmed by your spouse and the way she acts to you, right? Mm-hmm. And same thing, like I want to be a better father. What does that look like to be a better father? I want to be a great father. What does that look like to be a great father? It's pouring into the relationship of my kids, being present, being there, being available, doing experiences with them, doing life with them. And then I will get confirmed that I'm a great father when my son really needs it. And I know he calls me like he's lost and he needs some help and he's going to call his dad because I deposited so much in that. And that is where confirmation comes from in the future. Right. It's like we we always want to like get definite greatness. It's like, no, we just need to be and chase being better. And then eventually life will come back and saying, dude, you're doing an amazing job. Eventually you'll get validated by your kids, your wife, your peers, your whatever in pursuit of you chasing that better version of yourself. Yeah. But we get so tied into wanting to be great, wanting to be the best. I'm like, no, I just want to be better every yeah. day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I think I think that's a perfect spot to uh, you know, put a put a pin in it. Uh it's it's been a been a pleasure kind of going over a lot of this. I'm glad that we took these frameworks because I think it really did pull up to the surface a lot a lot of valuableness. Um, if you guys get a chance, probably go back and listen to this a second time. Daniel's a, is a quick shooter. So sometimes you might've thought you were listening, but you know, that second time through, just like, just like reading the word or working out every day, it, it, uh, it'll, it'll work, uh, work back on you. So Daniel, we always, we always finish with the same three questions. We have the power three, right? So I'm going to hit you with those before I let you go. Um, power, power three, uh, starts with, 
learning recommendation and it's just a little bit different not just an off-the-cuff learning recommendation more of you know like your kids or a significant other or anybody in your life if they were to be looking over your shoulder right now what's something that daniel has been actually curious about that you've been looking into maybe real estate maybe investments maybe just some some topic um what's something that you've been looking into and been interested in that the yeah. audience might find valuable there's two things right now that i'm i'm focusing on we just talked about one is is uh you know, I'm curiously chasing my faith right now. Mm-hmm. So I think if my kids woke up at the same time I woke up and they looked over my shoulder, it is 100% guaranteed I'd be doing the same thing all the time. It's usually either reading my scripture or the catechism of the Catholic faith. Mm-hmm. So that's something that I'm naturally interested in. Another thing I've really been diving into, um, um, how to become a better leader, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. A leader of, of my team, mm-hmm. a leader of myself, my, my family. Um, so that's something that I've really been pursuing a lot a lot more um, mm-hmm. knowing that I just have even though some people will see me as like you're a great leader but I think I'm just seeking to be better yeah yeah when it comes to leadership just to just to touch on that for a second um, when you found learning as uh, being part of GoBundance and kind of putting yourself um, in in relationship with guys that lead you know big organizations mm-hmm. has that been real helpful in kind of catching that do you find that more helpful than reading or kind of a combination of it all yeah. what are what are some of kind of your process when when you when you say hey i'm looking into leadership that that is your way of uh pulling in that that type of information yeah so a lot of it is is conversations that i have with guys right? okay um so i had a conversation with a guy named camaro moraz we're, we're actually interviewing with him tonight at seven to eight show mm-hmm. And he he's, he operates really big business, and he he told me and for anybody else's eyes, be like, man, the guy's uber successful. And he's like, you know, we talked and we're like, man, he's like, last week I had the same feeling of fear and anxiety that I had when I was 11 years old in Poland, um, sleeping in the hallway, mm. you know. And I'm just like, that's what I'm looking for. But he's he's a true leader, right? And it's the thing about leadership, and we learned this on the military. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be uncertain. But it's not okay to panic. And when I meet people that are under a lot of pressure, pressure that would melt somebody else's faith and just see them discern through that and stay calm and not panic, that's what I want to be more of. And I want proximity to the people that are so calm under pressure all the time. We, we talk about that in our real estate world. If something goes bad, right? Well, think about the calmest people when shit's going to hell, right? Like house is on fire. Yeah. Right, if a firefighter went into your house and started screaming like, "Ah, help me, come on! Oh my God, the house on fire! Follow me!" You'd be like, "Dude, get out of here!" But what does he do? He says, "Calm down." Yeah, calm. You're gonna be okay. Follow me. And guess what you do? Mm-hmm. You follow him, right? Mm-hmm. So, so that goes back again. My leadership is like seeing what's caught when I talk to them, as saying, "Look, it validates some of the fears and insecurities that I have. That sometimes I have to pretend I don't have because I am the leader." But like any leader, any commander, any person that's seen any of that stuff, they're always afraid. Yeah. They just don't panic. Yeah. And we all have different levels of imposter syndrome um, until you've done something enough times or elevated above it. Um, a sense of like, oh, I don't belong here. Who do I who do I mm-hmm. think I am? Right. You know, until until you've done it. And then and then that's why we're back to and sometimes if you have an imposter syndrome, we were having a conversation with that with a couple of those guys. It's like. If you have imposter syndrome, I that we're in a room full of a bunch of successful guys. How many of you guys here feel that you guys are imposters and they put their hands up? That means you're in the right room. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're stepping into bigger rooms. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. it's just it's up to it's up to you to fill them. Love it. Love it. So, uh, back to back to power three questions. Um, one being, uh, you know, if you if your kids got to step up they'd see that you're reading the bible or the catechism and then second uh leadership so number two would be a little bit more like like you always appreciate which is tactical Mm. and practical Mm. what's an action tip that the audience can take that if they applied to their life today for the next 30 days and on it would it would actually help change their lives i would just say action man um just breaking things down into small size pieces and then rewarding yourself with small wins okay yeah. Right, uh, just small win. Win the freaking morning, man. Like I can't tell you. Like if you just won the morning, so many people wake up and let life happen to them instead of them waking up and and, and having them happen to life. Right? Mm-hmm. It's like man, thirty day challenge. I would say wake up early. You know, journal, read, do a quick push ups, whatever. Just do one thing at a time, and, yeah. and that will forever. If you control your morning, it it changes everything. I tell my kids that all the time, and it's funny because they have the 
I, they'd probably call them dadisms. Like dad always says, that. it's like, yeah. well, buddy, you're sleeping. It's like, hey, why don't you wake up, make your dreams a reality, buddy? Let's go after it. <laughs> and it, and it's like, oh, come on, you know. Yeah, but it's yeah, true. Yeah. Like, come on, yeah. man. Life is great, man. Fucking be excited. Wake up. Go after it. Get up. Yeah. Make your dreams reality, man. Don't just be dreaming it. Yeah. So I mean, I think one actionable thing, and I have a big morning routine and stuff. It's just um, one of the most powerful things that you could do is just be more purposeful when you wake up. Mm-hmm. You know, and and just. Maybe if you win, it's not doing all five things that you would do. It's just, just do one thing. Let's just start by waking up early. That's yeah. it. And then just do that. And then, uh, and then slowly add on to that. You know, and it's amazing how... When you actually get in the driver's, when you get in the driver's seat of your life, like what, how, how you can kind of turn the car around. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And start right. implementing things. It's, it's, it's about action. I love that. Love that. So, all right. So you guys heard it. Take action on your life. Reverse engineer where you're trying to go. Maybe put some rewards for yourself along the way. And then get back in the driver's seat of your life. Like life is is short. If this is the one that we actually get, let's actually act like it and, and get in the driver's seat. And maybe you need to actually turn the car around, but get in the driver's seat and, and get to where you're actually trying to go. So power three question to finish up is, uh, you know, I haven't heard it anywhere else. I keep saying that it's my claim to fame because I think a lot of people would be scared to ask it. Um, but I feel like the guest that I've been put in front of can actually handle handle this question, which is who's somebody that you actually think is a good fit um, that would be good for this podcast? And it gets harder and harder as we get mm-hmm. great guests like yourself because you know a lot of amazing people. But yeah. somebody that you think would be an amazing guest for the show and you wouldn't mind making it a, a warm introduction to. You know, the, the first guy that pops in mind is Matt King. Okay. He's the CEO of GoBundance. All right. Whenever you get in front of a guy that's a leader of leaders, it's pretty special. Okay. A good story about, about uh, Matt King is he started in service. Like he was a go crew basically setting up tables and serving the guys that were in the room that he wanted to be in. And he served and he became a millionaire and he solved problems and he became the organization leader. He's the CEO of GoBundance and he also that's runs amazing. a... F- big family office, uh, David Osborne's office. Um, but he would be a guy that, like, man, what direction can you go? And, and he's, uh, I think he's like 32, 33 years old. Amazing, yeah. yeah. And uh, and that actually reminds me of working at In-N-Out. In-N-Out never hires managers directly. If you ever see a manager at an In-N-Out burger, at one point they were wiping the tables. Mm. And I think that there just is a testament to starting somewhere that no one can ever that you that you hire that that's where you start when you hire you're taking out garbage you're wiping tables maybe you get to bring out food to a guest maybe you're not even touching food yet um that that servant level of like starting somewhere and and rising up that's a huge test loyalty man and servitude you know i think it's another lesson like if if something that we we talk about that too like we're not in sales we don't sell houses Mm -hmm. we serve people yeah and it's like, if you want the doors of opportunity to be open up, live live in gratitude. Mm-hmm. Live live in gratitude, the doors of opportunities up, open up. But if you live life in servitude, the door gets freaking kicked down. And it's like, that's another thing I would have my kids to say, how can I teach them to have a servant's heart? Mm. And that's what Matt did. And he had a servant's heart and he raised up the leadership. And that's something like in, in and out. Who knows the culture more than the servant that mm-hmm. served through the years and, and, and saw himself grow by doing the things that, he was taught to do right and so, earn earn yeah. earn the right so matt this is the season finale right here with daniel <laughs> i'm pretty sure you know him real well so uh, we'll be coming for you in a future season matt king uh be on the lookout all right awesome. but brother i i really appreciate you having us in your house i appreciate you making the time for this like if uh, if i was paying for it my savings account might be yeah. empty <laughs> might be empty by now uh, but i i really really appreciate it and lo- always look forward to spending time with Likewise, you guys brother thanks good job man